It's showtime. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. You know, the right to bear arms is because that's the last form of defense against tyranny. Washington is fundamentally corrupt. There are more words in the IRS code than there are in the Bible. Made in America, heard around the world. You're listening to Blunt Force Truth. I'm Chuck Woolery, along with my co-host, Mark Young. And since I've just now lost my voice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What happened? It just went south on me there for a second. Oh, my I'm goodness. Back. Well, we got to bring that back because we cannot do Blunt Force Truth without the golden throat of Chuck yeah. Woolery. Yeah. Well, my friend, today we have a terrific guest with us today. Uh, our guest is Ryan Morrow, and Ryan is a counterterrorism expert, an expert in Islamic uh, terrorists and threat analysis. He's been on Sean Hannity show, Fox News, a lot of other places, works for government agencies. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a project that Ryan's involved with, uh, which is a movie or a documentary, Finding the Mountain of Moses. So, Ryan, welcome to Blunt Force Truth. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to talking about all this stuff. So now, is there a different mountain, or is it the same mountain? Uh, when you say finding the mountain, we kind of know where the mountain, at least we thought we knew where the mountain was, right? Perfect opening question. Um, so basically, the traditionally known Mount Sinai, uh, mm -hmm. there's been a lack of evidence found there. Uh, they have combed the desert, and because of the lack of evidence in that area, there's this academic consensus, even among Christian scholars, that the Exodus story is either a complete myth or like 99% made up. Um, and so that's led to people to propose about 20 different mountains. Um, but there's this one theory that I have found intriguing for a long time, um, wasn't 100% convinced of until I actually went to Saudi Arabia three times um, to see. Oh, so this mountain is in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, this is in northwestern Saudi Arabia. It's a different one, and it's known locally by the Saudis as Jebel Musa, the Mountain of Moses. So that's really interesting. The Mountain of Moses is not Sinai. It's this other mountain in Saudi Arabia where, the, where Noah supposedly landed the ark is on Ararat, which is in Turkey. I yeah. mean, and you can't get to any of these things easily to try to discover remnants or archaeological evidence is it but, yeah for me as a as a believer in god i think it's a it's like a holy irony like it's it, it's really amazing that worked out that way because the fact that you've had radical islamic elements in control of a lot of these archaeological sites is why we haven't been able to ruin them right. so um like the archaeological sites that you can see in in uh, my film for free on youtube it's called finding the mountain of moses one of the things you'll notice is that there are signs around it marking it as a sensitive archaeological site saying if you step any closer to this spot uh, you're you're going to go to jail well who put those signs up the saudi government so they acknowledge something's there but they they're not really going to say what it is um but it it matches the biblical account just precisely um and they have police patrol patrolling it give me an example of how it matches the biblical account during the ex it's during the exodus right right yeah. And so uh, Moses goes up on Mount, what they always thought was Sinai, but now you're saying it's Mount. It's, it, it's technically this other one called uh, Jebel Makla. People also call it Jebel El Laws, but it's northwestern Saudi Arabia. Okay. So is there any evidence that's physical that that would be the mountain? And <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of, I'm, I'm trying to rehearse in my memory exactly, I mean, the burning bush is part of that mountain, the Ten Commandments are part of that mountain, that mountain has a lot of experiences on it from the Old Testament. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't Moses be buried in that mountain? No, that would be uh, Mount Nebo, um, and I, I believe the Bible says that we would never find that, um, that, that that's forever hidden, but, uh, so that, Mount Nebo's in Jordan. So uh, at, basically, if you follow the book of Exodus from the Red Sea crossing on, there are lots of little details that you're not going to remember, that they moved east, they moved south, they camped by the water. We forget it because we have no point of reference. Mm -hmm. um, but if you use the Bible like a treasure map uh, the, and you follow this specific alternative route, you run into evidence of like everything that's described. So for example, uh, at 
uh, this possible Red Sea crossing point, what the Bible calls Yam Suf. Uh, it, on the Egyptian side, it's the Nueva Beach. And it's this massive beach where you can actually fit millions of people. It's, the mountains come almost completely around it, just like the Bible and other historical sources say. And you can see how Pharaoh's army would have them trapped there. Now, just at that point, according to the knowledge that we have now, from that beach, under the water, is a land path that goes into Saudi Arabia. So what would happen if you parted the waters? There'd actually be a spot for the Israelites to walk through and get to this spot in Saudi Arabia, where then you find evidence of the other places that they stopped on the way to Mount Sinai. And then at this new Mount Sinai candidate, there's plenty of evidence right there that I can also explain. But starting from the beginning, that would be uh, where we think the Red Sea crossing point most likely happened. So th this is described biblically as the wilderness, as they wandered 40 days or 40 years in the wilderness. What, what, where was this back then? I mean, it wasn't Saudi Arabia. What was it a part of? Now, we know where Egypt was, and we know where Israel kind of was at the time. Uh, there was no Jordan. There was no, you know, they were all different names. Right. So where did this exodus take place? Across what land mass? Well, they would have been going through the what we call the Gulf of Aqaba right now, which is uh, part of the Red Sea, but the Bible it, it calls it Yam Suf. Um, but the specific area that of what we call Saudi Arabia back then was known as Midian. So you look in the book of Exodus, it says Moses killed the Egyptian, then he fled to Midian, comes back to Egypt, and then they again leave. Um, and Midian is mostly or entirely northwestern Saudi Arabia. If you, if you look at maps, that's, that's like something people won't contest. So that's where we should have been looking for a long, long time. But uh, tradition and consensus can be a stubborn thing. Mm -hmm. So what kind of evidence did you see? And, and I want to back this up with, I am fascinated by the repeated uh, events that happen where you see science confirming the Bible. Yeah. And we're seeing these things happen over and over. I mean, I don't know if you know, a, a gentleman I know in Israel, his name is Professor Fain. I don't know if you know him or not. I don't. He, run, he runs the Dead Sea Scrolls Project at the University uh, right. of Hebrews. And he has shown me stuff, and some of the stuff that he, is, that he has. So as an example, is able to take the Dead Sea Scrolls and show how they're word for word the same as the current Bible we're using. And, and the phenomenon of how many years could something have been scribed and no one changed the meaning. Right. You know, what were the odds on that? And then we go to Genesis 6-2, or Genesis 6-3, where it says, you know, man should not live forever, but he shall live to be 120 years. And then we come forward to 1963 when Dr. Hayfleck discovered cell replication and proved that humans could only live to be 120 years. I mean, the exact number. So these, these, these things are, are fascinating. Yeah, what what hard evidence, what's the hard evidence that you found that, that tells you, Ryan, Moses was here. This story is not a fable. This is a real story. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I identify as a Christian, but I have uh, atheist days. I'm open about that. Um, so so uh, there, there's some level of... So you're identifying as what? An atheist what? On some days, uh, I'm an atheist, just like anyone else, you know? So that Because I'm, I'm very cynical by nature. So when I research this stuff, I'm always looking to poke holes in it because... Um, so you uh, research it as a scientist, not as a Christian. Right. I'm not a scientist, but, that, but that's what's fun for me is trying to poke holes in theories and, and figure these things out. But right at the mountain, man, there's so much. But I would say the first thing that you'll see in the plain where the Israelites probably would have camped, and there's room for millions of people, is if you remember the golden calf story where Moses is up on Mount Sinai and then some of them start worshiping a golden calf. Well, right in, in front of the mountain, and you can, you can see exactly how Moses would have first heard this and then, and then seen it. Uh, there is, again, a marked off archaeological site with a pile of rocks with a flat top that has petroglyphs of people worshiping cows, like Egyptian style. Mm -hmm. and, and so they drew it all out. And on the top, you can even see an indentation where the golden calf might have once stood. I mean, that's speculation on my part. 
and then an, what looks to be an altar in front of it, because the Bible says that there was the golden calf they were worshiping, and then an altar in front of it. And that's all fenced in, and, and all the locals know about it, too. Um, and then the Bible says that at the foot of Mount Sinai, God tells Moses to set up an altar of uncut stone without stairs so that he can do animal sacrifices. You go to the foot of this mountain, there's an altar of uncut stone without stairs. You still see the animal corrals. It's next to where a stream would have flowed, just like the Bible says happened at Mount Sinai for, for, for the ceremonial washing. And uh, the Bible says that God told Moses next to that altar, set up 12 pillars to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Right next to this altar is not 12, but it's about 12 that we could find marble pillars. And I would add to this, those that have gone to this, these sites before me, because I didn't, I'm not claiming to discover it, but I'm one of only a handful of people to ever actually make it to these sites. Uh, the Saudis arrested them and took away all their evidence. So what's exciting about this documentary is that we, for the first time now, have public drone footage and high-quality footage to show this to the entire world. How did you get the Saudis to give you this access? Uh, well, We'll just uh, call that a secret. <laughs> we don't want to give away our methods. All right. Well, I, I happen to work with an organization that we sometimes do things outside of the normal, the normal paths to get things done. Right, right. The, so, the other big thing, um, if I have just a, another minute, because this is the thing right. that everyone talks about, is uh, the Bible says that God told Moses when the people had no water to go up to a rock and strike it with his rod. Right. And then the, the rock would split and water would come out. Now you follow this route, you come up to a, a 100 foot hill and on top of it is like a 50 foot rock and it's split down the middle. And the locals refer to it as the water of Moses. And the, water, the rock is smooth, like you can see it looks like a stream of water came down from it. You drive and everything's real bumpy. And then all of a sudden you look and you're like, what went on here? And it looks like streams coming down from that crack in the, in this gigantic rock. Now there's no water so coming out of it now. It's interesting right. with the rock, the rock story. Uh, God didn't tell him to strike the rock. He told him to speak to the rock. Oh, there's two incidents. There's Kadesh Barnia. That, that comes later. Moses was a little bit uh, on edge, and he struck the rock. And from that ang that point of anger, he was never allowed to go into the promised land. That right, so that reason. was from... Uh, that was the reason he couldn't go in the promised land. That was his punishment. Yeah, that was a contrast. There were, there's actually two uh, split rock incidents in the Bible. So there's the, the, the first time where he strikes it with his rod, um, as God instructs him, but then later on, God says, just speak to the rock, and, and Moses gets impatient, and so he's like, I'm just going to take this rod like I did before, as if, as if the rod is God, and then strikes it, and then that's why he wasn't allowed into the promised land. So it's a contrast between those two incidents. Yeah. Why do you suppose the Saudis protect these sites? Well, it is part of Islamic tradition, so that's part of it. Um, we do know so, a lot of Saudi officials believe that this is the route of the Exodus. Uh, certainly all the, lo the locals would just run up to us and say, you know, the Yahud, the Jews were here, and we want to tell you all about it. Um, but then uh, there are geopolitical consequences to it. Um, another reason, and this is shown in, in the film, I interviewed a former jihadist, a guy that used to hang out with associates of Osama bin Laden, who I know. And he already knew about this. Like, so few people know about it. He's like, yeah, we already, we, yeah, me and the jihadists I hung out with, we knew about this. And, and we agreed with the Saudis in not announcing it and in covering it up because according to their version of Sharia law, any site that becomes idolatrous, if people start worshiping the mountain or the archaeological sites or they take dirt and they sell it as like a miracle cure, then they have to destroy it. So from their perspective... It makes sense geopolitically and, and as well as from a Sharia law perspective to just leave it alone, have police make sure outsiders can't come in and, and, and just leave it like that. Um, but now the game's up. Uh, now, now the world press is, is reporting on this because I saw the construction going on in the area um, that could at the very least ruin the scenery, which, which is a bummer because when you drive there, like it's better than Egypt. You really feel like you're going back in time to the Exodus 
when you see all of this, uh, and, and I would hate for there to be swimming pools and shopping centers ruining that for people if this were to one day be opened up for tourism. What other kind of evidence did you find? You know, what, you know, did you find something that would indicate the burning bush was there, or, or what did you locate? There has been speculation about one spot inside a certain valley about a, a possible burning bush tenant. That's technically a tree, but it looks like a bush. Um, you know, I'm not going to advocate for it because we, we have to get there and do testing. I haven't actually physically gone to that spot, but we've seen old pictures. Um, but another piece of evidence would be the fact that after the Red Sea crossing happens, the second encampment that they go to is a place called Elam. And, and at Elam uh, is where there are 70 palm trees and 12 wells. They see that as a miracle because there's 12 tribes of Israel. And so they're like, wow, that's amazing. Now today you follow this route and you get to an oasis uh, right by the water like is described in the book of Exodus. And there's many more palm trees because they populate over time. But to this day, there's still 12 wells. And the locals will say, yeah, that, this is Elam. These are the wells of Moses. No kidding. Yeah, it's amazing. So, so, go ahead, Chuck. You know, it's very interesting while we prove these things to ourselves or validate them to ourselves, whether it's the ark, uh, finding the ark, uh, all the archaeology that's done in Israel, uh, you know, the Catholic Church for years would fake pieces of antiquity and swear that they were part of the cross and so on. <laughs> and it's so important to people. It's uh, why do you think that is? Is it, is it their faith is not strong enough to validate where they are? Or they just need that, that extra push because I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that in the fact that none of this will change a person who doesn't believe it's not going to change their path or look at this and go, Oh my gosh, it's real. I'm, I, I, I believe in everything now. Um, well, I mean, I've gotten messages from people who uh, were atheists and, and frankly, who I knew were quite condescending to believers before um, and have now changed their mind. Really? As a result of the Is that yeah. right? Well, then I... Yeah, people I knew personally. And uh, so it does touch people. And I've got to tell you that that sentiment that people have where they need a lot of evidence for faith, and even if they have those spiritual feelings, like this metaphysical thing, um, are they necessarily? Well, I'm always reminded when Jesus said, "You know, I could come back and perform miracles for you." You still wouldn't believe me. <laughs> I mean, right, right. It, but I'm the personification of that cynicism, right? So I'm the type of guy who, like, I believe. And there's times where I'm like, "Man, look at, look at what God just just did." Uh, and then the next day, I'll be like, "Oh, well, that might have been a coincidence," because I'm just I'm so analytical and cynical by nature. Um, so I guess that, that maybe that's what made me a good fit for this project. Um, so I totally get it. The idea of, uh, if you're going to make extraordinary claims, uh, you better have extraordinary evidence. And it turns out as technology advances and, and we expand our thinking a little bit and look in some new areas, we're finding that evidence. I'd like to introduce you to a new type of podcast. And by new, I mean, there's never been anything like this before, not in terms of scope or ambition. The show is called Living Beyond 120. Science proved that lifespan could exceed 120 years back in the 1960s, and the Bible first mentioned living to 120 years 6,000 years ago in the book of Genesis. But the question is, how do we get there? Living Beyond 120 tries to answer this question. The show is an exploration into human longevity and what it will take for us to live longer, healthier lives, featuring interviews with some of the most respected minds in longevity science and tackling big subjects like how the medical system, big pharma, and maybe even our own government don't want you to live longer. Living Beyond 120, it's hosted by me and my co-host, medical expert, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. You'll find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast directory, and you can also listen to it at the website livingbeyond120.com. Now, Ryan, you have a, you have a lot of history uh, working in the Middle East and understanding uh, Islam and terrorists and, and terrorism and all of those things, which clearly made you a good candidate for this. Um. But I want to switch over to, to some of those questions for a minute. 
We're hearing right now that ISIS is on the ropes. ISIS is pretty destroyed. Um, is, that, is that a legitimate observation? It's legitimate with a giant asterisk. Um, and that's because I've studied the, uh, not just the ideology of radical Islam as a whole, but I've studied the end times prophecies that ISIS believes they're fulfilling. And that's like the key to everything. If you don't see that part of it, then you're not really getting ISIS. So, so let, let's go there for a minute. Yeah. We have, so in the Bible, we have the book of Revelation. Now, clearly they're not following the book of Revelation, but ISIS, and I believe to some extent, some of the leaders in Iran mm -hmm. see themselves as trying to fulfill their end time prophecy, which ends with what? Ends with a child imam, I believe. Uh, uh, some, some, they basically say he's an adult for, uh, the Iranians will say that he's uh, down in a well and he's going correct. to from a well. Uh, the Sunnis will say this Mahdi, this messianic figure will come from somewhere else. Um, and their version of Jesus will show up and according to the radicals, institute Sharia law, debunk Christianity, and then help uh, behead people. So, <laughs> so if we understand, others, yeah. so if we understand their version of, of end times, where the Christian version, our version of end times does have a lot of really bad times, which re results in the return of Jesus and a thousand years of peace, they see that they need to cause a Holocaust. They need, they want to be a part of creating the destruction of the world so that they can usher this in. Am I, am I going down the right path here? Right. So there's two ways that the Islamic extremists will look at this. Um, the, the first is that some say you have to actually make all of this happen. Uh, and the centerpiece is this grand war focused on destroying Israel. Um, so you're supposed to actually kick these things into gear. Then there are those that say, well, you're supposed to wage jihad anyway as a religious obligation. And then at some appointed time by Allah, these things are going to come together. And man, I hope I'm one of those end times characters. It doesn't really matter which way they think, but ISIS does believe that they are those end times characters. And according to the prophecies they believe, they will be initially successful. Then they're going to have about a third of their people killed. A third are going to flee. And the remaining one third at the end when they're about to be defeated is when they make their grand comeback. So we're in a, actually a bad position when we're saying, oh, we've destroyed 99% of their caliphate. Uh, but then we pull troops out of Syria or we stop paying attention to ISIS because to them, that's exactly how the prophecy goes. So things are on time for them. <laughs> yes. and, and they're okay with, getting, with a bunch of them getting killed off because it's the goal, which right. is very difficult for us. Because when we look at, at, at defending our country, we look at survivors. We want to we live. But if I'm understanding you correctly, for many of these people, the goal is to die. Yes, yeah. So then there's that personal motivation. So we just discussed the end times view of things and why them losing most of their caliphate isn't really a problem to them. That's that's actually vindication. That means they're about to they're they're about to really knock us out. Um, but then on the personal, real selfish level, and this is something you I haven't seen any media network really get into. Probably because it sounds too evangelistic. But if you look at the wiretap transcripts of ISIS suspects. Most of them at some point will say the reason that they're about to do what they're trying to do before we arrest them is because they've done something to offend Allah, like drinking, um, hanging out with women. And they say, man, at some point, they say, man, I have so much sin. I've done so many bad things, and I don't know how I'm going to get into paradise, how I, I can win Allah's approval, except for the most extreme method, which is killing the infidel and dying in violent jihad. And I will see that same thing over and over again. So, so there's a mixture of, yeah, they think they're better than us. They're, they're supremacism, but there's also a lot of shame over their own sin and trying to figure out how to atone for that sin. And the answer is go blow people up. So, so this is a very, this is a religion and that controls people very much through guilt then. 
yeah, and you and you see this per this is pervasive throughout the the Muslim world. Uh, this issue of like uh, you know the slightest sin it, that that might prevent you from getting close to Allah and getting into paradise. And so they're gonna the moderates, and we have many Muslim allies. Uh, that's going to have to be addressed theologically if we're to ever get past this. So obviously, it is impossible then to negotiate with an ISIS or an Al Qaeda because we're negotiating for peace and they're negotiating with the intent on dying. Right. The most that they even believe theologically they can agree to is a temporary ceasefire that leaves them stronger at the end of that period, at which point they resume the jihad. That's so just a, re a retreat and regroup is all they're interested in. Right. So when they talk about a ceasefire or a peace, uh, literally translated into radical Islamic vernacular, that's what they're talking about, a hudna. It, it, it's different than the word we're using, and we don't realize it. So, so are the jihadists, are the ISIS people, are they interpreting Islam correctly and interpreting it to the letter? And the modern uh, Islamic faith is is not reading it purely, or are the jihadists distorting the Islamic faith? Who's, who, somebody's got to be distorting the faith here. All right. So all of these groups, many of which will kill each other, are interpreting it literally. Sometimes they will disagree over which sources outside the Quran carry authority and which ones do not. Um, but over the most minor thing, they'll kill each other. So to me, I, I can't say who has the right version of Islam because you have a thousand different jihadist groups all interpreting it differently in some way. And then you have your Muslim progressives that are, take, that are trying to interpret it in a more modern way, saying there are certain things we can discard or there are certain things that were for a certain period of time and never to be revived. Um, and so you have the, the, this big battle of ideas going on between the more reformers, uh, the, the Muslims that we ally with that become intelligence sources and that sort of thing. Um, and then you have a lot of disagreement within the jihadist camp over how to interpret and apply a lot of this. So we would be considered, what is it, Chuck, Kafirs that we would be considered? We would be a Kafir. So in the, in the pecking order of who's a horrible person, are we at the top of the list of horrible people or would actual Islamic progressives be even worse than us in the eyes of a group like ISIS? Muslim progressives. The punishment uh, for apostates is always death. Uh, whereas for the rest of us, eh, maybe we could come later or maybe we can have a ceasefire. Um, but the overall goal uh, is global conquest for all of these groups, even ones like Hamas that say it's just, that they're focused on destroying Israel. The reason that they're talking about destroying Israel is because that's where they're located. It's the near-term enemy. Uh, but then they're part of a global movement that still says destroy the United States, Canada, Sweden, all of it. Well, it's right. not as if they haven't tried this before. Right. I mean, the 1400s, they were in Spain. And actually, Ferdinand and Isabella kicked them out. Yeah. Um, but they were murdering by the thousands people in Spain and trying to take over Europe. And so it's, you know, it's happened before, uh, you know, a little before Columbus, I guess, but it's happened. And, and we do see them killing their own, their own people more than they're killing us in many, in many cases. Right. And so part of the reason that they'll do that, aside from the fact that they want to make sure that their side is solid, um, is because of the, of the theological requirement that you kill apostates, um, but also in their mind, when things don't go right, it's because there's some sort of sin, some way you are not satisfying Allah's wishes. And so you turn, they turn inwards and they say, okay, why is our country so crappy? Well, there must be some type of Jewish influence or Western <laughs> influence in here. Uh, so which among us is, is doing that? And then they uh, attack their own. Uh, now, the, here's where that's positive for us. There, the, there's a flip side. And this is why you'll see groups like ISIS just blow up out of nowhere and then collapse and then come right back. As soon as they have a series of victories, especially ones that appear unlikely, that is interpreted across the Muslim world, including by ones that may originally think that that specific group is crazy and makes no sense. That's interpreted as Allah's way of saying those guys got the interpretation right. 
So when you have ISIS, a small group, suddenly take over a massive part of Iraq and Syria, that's why there is this huge gravitational pull towards them from other jihadists and then other people who may not have been jihadists but saw that and said, obviously God is blessing them and I, and I don't need to study. They figured it out. Now, the flip side is when we beat them up, and when we crush them and we, and we brag about it, and we make sure everyone knows about it. And I don't think we do a good enough job of touting our successes at all. But when we do that, that is viewed as Allah's judgment, that he will actually use the adversaries of Muslims as a form of judgment. And then they have to say to themselves, where did we go wrong? Was it a certain tactic? What, what, what did we do that offended Allah that's in, resulting in us being destroyed now? Uh, and that's that's the process we need to kick off. And the only way that you make that happen is by defeating them abundantly. Well, I you would think I, it's a great recruiting tool too, Chuck. Think about it. If if you live over there and you're you're kind of looking and saying, geez, there's a really good chance somebody will cut my head off if I don't agree with that side. Maybe that's a really good recruiting tool to get you to flip over to their side. You know, there's a part <laughs> of the world my head. That, that uh, nobody talks about much. It's talked about a little bit, but uh, that's Indonesia. And uh, Indonesia is, uh, I mean, uh, one of the biggest battles uh, that I recall in, um, oh, it starts with a B, Bali, uh, were Hindus and Muslims going against each other, just like they did in, in India. What's going on in that part of the world? I mean, it's happening there. They've got through the Philippines, all yeah. through Indonesia, uh, we don't really, they're not Arab and they're not, uh, you know, we just don't attach Muslims to them because they're basically Asian and yeah. it doesn't look right. doesn't seem right. doesn't fit the mold, but they're there too. They're exactly, exactly right. And they're not in the news as much because it's not the Middle East. The Middle East, you've always got some good news headlines coming out of there if you're a news producer, right? But mm -hmm. Philippines, it's just not there. But uh, we have seen a massive uptick in r radicalization of Muslims in places like the Philippines. Um, and, and it's really very frightening, gets very little attention. In Indonesia, what's interesting there is that that's where you've seen a massive clash between the more uh, modern thinking Muslims and the extremists where the moderates have won on, on many occasions. There's a group there, uh, the Nadla Tool Ulema, basically one of, if not the largest, Islamic groups in the world, but they're kind of quiet um, because they're not complaining and threatening all the time, uh, so they don't get much attention. Um, but they come out of there and they have a, a, a much more progressive way of looking uh, to the point that they promote a book called The Illusion of the Islamic State, meaning Muslims shouldn't pursue the concept of an Islamic state, a theocracy, anymore. That's a thing of the past. Throw it in the trash. Um, so the good guys... Uh, th these Muslims that we work with, perhaps their biggest disadvantage is that they don't get attention because they're good guys. That's not news. Mm -hmm. So do they come out? Because uh, you don't, for, at least in the press, you don't see that many of the moderate uh, Islamic leaders coming out and attacking uh, the radicals when, when you see these attacks. Why are they not more outspoken? I will say this, when it comes to the most extreme of the extreme groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and they, and they do a shooting on American soil, uh, whenever there is a reporter asking any mom um, if they are condemning the attacks, just about every single time they will. Um, now they'll have, they'll be extreme in other ways. So that's a problem. So you'll have a lot of people are connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, um, to Pakistani extremist groups that the media will make it look like they're the, the moderate you've been waiting for because they condemn Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, but their extremism is just in a different right. direction. They're in Hamas instead of ISIS. Right, right. Or they might think that ISIS is a Jew Jewish plot. I mean, that's a common way uh, I've seen uh, condemnations happen. Yeah, we condemn Al-Qaeda and what happened on 9-11. The Jews did it. <laughs> so it's not like a real condemnation. Um, but it, yeah, they, those kind of nations don't get as much attention simply because it's not as newsworthy, but you're also, you don't have the infrastructure within the United States yet 
to really wage that war of ideas. We have friends like Zudi Jasser, who's on Fox News all, all the time, who are trying to separate mosque and state and are out there pushing it. Um, but his forces can't compete with the millions of dollars coming in from Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. And one thing I would add, though, I just got to say this. When I was in northwestern Saudi Arabia, uh, the Saudis that I met with were, were great and were saying things that definitely contradicted the hardline Saudi Wahhabist way of thinking. So I, I did see a lot of hope coming out of at least that area of Saudi Arabia. I mean, Chuck, let me ask you a question, just being on the level here. When you see an imam get on TV in the U.S. and say, no, we condemn what's going on, are you comforted by that, or do you, do you question whether, it's, whether he's telling the truth? I don't know whether they're telling the truth or not. Uh, it's, um, I'm kind of an anti-Islamist. I, I just am. I, I think the whole religion is, you know, is a lie, and so I have a problem just at the beginning, no matter how it fractures itself and what they become. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you, when you look at India, in the 40s or 50s, maybe the late 40s, when uh, it had to be broken up, freedom at midnight, uh, everybody split off the Muslims and the Hindus. And, and then the Muslims, a place was created by the British for them called Pakistan, which I don't think most people even understand today. Mm. But, uh, and then Kashmir right in the middle, which they both claimed, and they're still fighting over that. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many geopolitical things going on with, with religions and wars and Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Jews. And my gosh, it just goes on and on. It never stops. And I suppose it's been going on forever. It's just that the weapons are far more um, capable of killing more people today. Uh, but this is nothing new. That, that's the thing that's interesting to me is it's nothing new. It's just that we cover it by news. We cover it by drones. We, you know, we hear about it more and more and more. It's wider spread. Uh, we have, I mean, there are hardly any Christians left in the Middle East. They're killing all of them. Uh, and people seem to go, well, you know, so what? I mean, that's what really bothers me more than anything else. It's like this, this kind of like, well, you know, it's just the way it goes. Well, Ryan, do, do we have people in the Islamic faith that – that are legitimately seeking peace that, that we should be able to trust? Oh, sure. I mean, we have intelligence sources. Uh, the group I work for, Clarion Project, which is completely separate from the Mount Sinai thing that I'm doing on my own, um, I lead their intelligence section. And so we have Muslims deeply embedded within radical Islamic communities who... What do they hope to achieve? What's that? Muslims who are deeply embedded in the, in the radical Muslims camp. What? Uh, what do they expect to achieve on the, in the long run? Some of them will say that that's their jihad, uh, that their, their jihad is, is against those bad ones. So they view them as the apostates. Um, but most of them uh, have taken a modern interpretation of their faith and, and that says, look, I can be a believing Muslim, and that's compatible with believing in America's form of secular governance with democracy. It makes sense. Um, and, and then there are others who just might have a grievance against a group that they used to belong to, and they may have some radical beliefs that they, they have discarded, and then some others, it's lingering a little bit, you know. Um, but overall, the, whoever it is that they're spying on, uh, they have an, an ideological and moral obligation to do so um, when they're doing it. Um, and that's why they come to us, because it's not like we can pay them a million dollars. So you you had brought up the constant attack on Israel. We're also seeing uh, a real strong movement now on Holocaust denying. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Because, I mean, that just is bizarre to me because we've got the footage. We've got film of the Holocaust. It's not like it's, it's not like it's 500 years ago. We have all kinds of things that are, we see every day that people on television deny happened and it happened yesterday, (laughs) (laughs) 70 years ago. Yeah. I mean, it's things like that. And like, but particularly Holocaust denial that, that drives me to a point where uh, that's where my morale could, could fall to the point where, 
I just find the easiest job I can. And, and that's what I do for the rest of my life. Cause it's like, if people are buying into that, like, what's the point? Like what's the point of trying? But you, I don't know if you saw the poll about how many people in Britain in the, where Churchill came from, uh, don't believe in the Holocaust, uh, the, that it ever actually happened. I think it was, whatever it was, it was just a tiny few percent, but it was still the numbers. Uh, it came to, to millions, but what the newspaper headlines about that, and, and this is just Britain, this isn't even the Islamic world where Holocaust denial is like all, all over the place. It, it, there was an additional question that was further down the article where it said, well, do you believe the Holocaust happened but is greatly exaggerated that you've been lied to basically about the scope of it? And that percentage w was many times higher. I mean, that to me is just as revolting as just flat out Holocaust denial. It's, and, and, like, why are you even, why do you have that impulse? Why, why are you even coming to that opinion? Why are you even questioning it? What's that say about what's going on in your mind and what the future of your country is? Because those Holocaust deniers and those people that say it's exaggerated, they're going to have children and they're going to be saying those things to their kids. That's the future of the world right there. Um, and it, it, if things are so bad where you can get even a, a significant percentage of a country like the UK denying the Holocaust, hey, look, then my God, what, what type of beliefs are, is the next generation going to have? Gonna we, have? have we have architectural and archaeological, ar archaeological evidence. We have film. We have, I mean, it's insane. And, and yet people still, there's that percentage of people who can be swayed to believe anything and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can say. There's, they just, they are beyond reason. And I think this is what we're seeing more and more of today is that more people are becoming just beyond reason. They are so ideolo ideologically attached to what they believe in, what they think is real, that they will believe anything in order to reinforce it. And Why the hatred for this group of people, though, Chuck? Why the hatred for the Jewish people? It's gone on for thousands of years. Thousands. I mean, are, are, we, are we still looking at, at Isaac and Ishmael? Are we yes. still having that, that family feud? Well, it's not a family feud. This is a whole separation. I mean, it's separation of two, two completely different ideologies, even back then. And so, yeah, it's been going on since almost the beginning of time, certainly since the beginning of Jews. I mean, it's been going on since then, and Isaac and Ishmael and uh, Abraham, and you just go on and on and on. It's been fostering and festering itself. Uh, they're both equally described as what kind of personalities they will be and what kind of personalities will flow from their issue, and no one pays attention to it because it's ancient history at this point. They can't seem to make it relate. And uh, I don't know what the purpose of this is. There must be a purpose behind it of some kind, but uh, I'm not sure what that is. But, uh, you know, it's not. It's a bizarre. Well, it, well, what's amazing to me is how, how much it goes beyond the Islamic arena now where um, I've got to tell you, just from my own interaction with law enforcement, it's absolutely true that the threat from like KKK types and Nazi types, mm -hmm. white supremacists, that really, that really is skyrocketing. But you'll have like, radical Muslims promoting David Duke and neo-Nazis and Holocaust deniers that hate Muslims. Like, like they'll promote people that hate themselves because they both hate Jews. And right. so you have this convergence between, they call them the far right. I don't like that terminology. Just like I don't like they're the not far right far left. I don't, I don't like that. Term, but, but you know what I mean? Like the, the Marxists and the white supremacists and, and the jihadists, and you'll see them all coming together when it comes to the issue of, the Jews or anyone that, that they is the far the left, Jews. right? They're all hating the Jews, though. Hey, listen. The next stop, if 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 the Constitution is in the center, the next stop for the far right is anarchy. There is nothing in between. If you move to the left, there's all kinds of stuff in between. There's dictatorship and monarchy and oligarchy and and socialism, communism, fascism. Just a myriad of different facets of, of what the left is. And, and sometimes they encompass all of it. Well, Ryan, with your background and you're talking about, uh, you're, you're seeing from your vantage point, you're seeing an increase in things like white supremacy and the KKK is, and this is not, so I'm not a supporter of white supremacy or the KKK by any stretch of the imagination, 
but is this a reaction to the non to the onslaught in the media against white males are these people are some people feeling marginalized or feeling fearful for being a white male and that's why they're gravitating to these hate groups i would say they take a very tiny kernel of truth behind that and they create a an information bubble where they're constantly being reminded of, of it, lied to about the size of it, making them feel like they're in peril. And then, of course, mixing it with racial stereotypes and ideas for all, other forms of governance. Um, and then that's how you can see things escalating from someone that believes that there's going to be or should be a race war. Then the next thing you know, they're looking at Nazi propaganda on YouTube because you've opened up your mind to that evil. So that evil that you thought before should be rejected, you now accept. You're going to then going to look at other things, and then it all kind of comes together. And so one of the big warnings I've been saying uh, for the past few years is what I call the war of the extremes. So we've even the vast majority of my time has been focused on jihadists, but what I'm seeing is that all of these evils are growing together. And we haven't reached the point with there's lots of gasoline, there's lots of matches. We haven't reached the point yet where multiple flames have combined with that gasoline at once. But it I think it's cocktail. inevitable. It is a cocktail. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a hideous cocktail. It's exactly what it is. It's a cocktail of disaster. What do you yeah. think of people just uh, don't love each other more? You know what I mean? Like overall, it's just like you disagree with someone and they must be stupid or they must be evil. It's never like in, in your average dialogue. And I'm seeing this with people, I'm 32 and I'm seeing this with people my age, but especially, you know, early twenties, the idea of honest disagreement doesn't, it's like, it doesn't exist anymore. It must be because you're stupid or you're part of a malevolent force and you've been indoctrinated and for the sake of the country, you, you, you either better have your mind changed or, or you better get out of the way. It's so like what did my like parents, that. what did my parents who would now be in their hundreds say to me as I, as a child growing up, you want to be friends with people, never discuss politics and never discuss religion. Your parents were smart. But I mean, how long has this been going on? And of course, all we do today is discuss religion and politics. That is, it's pretty much television in a bubble. All of these news uh, entities have become basically gossip sites. They don't even report the news anymore. They just gossip with each other about what they think is going to happen, what if, and if it could be, and it's possible. And that's not news. It's, it's all opinion and conjecture, and it's all mixed together in this cocktail again of, of misinformation, misdirection. And here we are in the middle of everybody talking about politics, everybody talking about religion, and we all hate each other. What's the surprise? That's true. You really can't escape it. I mean, one of the things that boggles my mind is that they have all those TVs at the airport uh, with the news on, and it's like you're taking a plate like one of the most miserable places in America. Are those really airports. making it miserable? And then you, and then you're reminding people with the news headlines just going and going. You go onto Facebook so you can look at pictures of cats, and it's like you now you have the news feed right next to it. Uh, right. So people just can't escape it, and then you mix that in with you know all, all of these evil propagandas coming in, and fundamentally, yeah, just news. people don't love news. to learn and challenge their ideas anymore. Like. It's so much fun for me to read some book that I initially disagree with and, and highlight the areas where I, I can see some convergence or maybe where I need to change how I'm looking at things a little bit or some new data. Like that's a fun process. And that's the point. I, like I read Tanisha Coates' recent book. Now, for me to take on, for me to say that I'm going to agree with a guy who's essentially a black supremacist is probably not going to happen but I still read his book because I wanted to get in his head. Yeah. And I wanted to say, okay, why does this guy feel the way he does? And by the way, when I read the book, I did understand some of the things that motivated him. And some, of, I don't agree with them, but at least I understand a little bit of what the world looks like through his eyes. You could talk to him probably, right? Like it may not, you, you might be uncomfortable, but, but the, you could have a conversation if you had to, right? 
Yeah, I can, I can understand that he had these racist things that happened in his childhood, that these shaped some of, some of the way he viewed the world. And I can accept that. I don't accept his response to them, but I can accept they happened. Right. You know, but the if, funny thing about it is, I'm going I'm to say something here. It'd be a little controversial. I may get some you, back on it. You be controversial? Uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> if you are on the so-called right and you have someone on the so-called left, the person on the right can talk to the person on the left. I'm not so sure the person on the left can talk to the person on the right, nor will they. Because the left is so demanding that you believe what they believe, that you think the way they think, that there is no latitude in the modern day discussion. That's why there is no discussion, because no one listens to anybody. They don't respect what you say. They don't respect how you feel. They don't respect where you come from. And if you do, you are crushed by the weight of force of what they believe, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's interesting, Chuck, that the party of diversity is not interested in diversity of thought. Well, I, I see it both ways, to be honest with you, because I've had speaking engagements where uh, I'll be talking about Islamic extremism or whatever, and then some people who just don't like Muslims or especially just foreigners in general will show up, um, and the stuff they'll say to me and yeah, not let I, it go. I can, I can see that. Yeah, I'm sure they're on they're, both they're, sides. That's a minority of people. You would have to admit that's not the majority of people. I, I think where Chuck's going with this is at every event. I mean, any any event that's sizable, the, there'll be people there that are saying I'm an agent of Saudi Arabia, um, that I'm part of the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, I've had people say that to my face. I think where Chuck's going with this is there was some polling data that was done recently that showed that. Uh, people who identify themselves as conservatives or Republicans showed that it was in the 30 percentile that they would consider dropping a relationship due to the opposing, uh, you know, political views. But people who identified themselves as liberal, socialists, and Democrats, it was like 56 percent of them that oh said God. they would they would end a relationship with a conservative a close relationship with a conservative. So I think Chuck's point is there's some on both sides, but there appears to be more intolerance on the side that claims tolerance. I can't argue with the data. I mean, you came with the data, so. I live in Hollywood for, you know, 45, 50 years. Believe me, I know. Uh, And I was not dogmatic about anything that I believed in. But uh, if I didn't keep it quiet, I didn't work. And that's that simple. It's just that simple. You did not go to work for anyone. If you were, if you were a Republican, forget being a conservative, because I'm more of a conservative and less as a, as a, as a Republican. Uh, in fact, I personally don't even like the Republican Party. But uh, I, I don't. I, it's, it's, it's not conservative at all in any way. It's not centrist at all in any way. It's more left and it has no backbone and it's disgusting. Well, for the most part, Chuck, if you look at the two parties, the Democratic Party has become the Socialist Party. But it's always, and it's been that way for a hundred years. I agree. Years. Everybody keeps saying it's become this miraculous right. of socialism. Hell, it's been that way since Woodrow Absolutely. Wilson. I agree. Right. But my but point Chuck, is. I've got to ask you, how were how you happy then in that, in that, like, I can't imagine being in an environment where I can't speak my mind even politely because I might lose my job. And if I succeeded in doing it because I liked the job, I still feel like over time there'd be mental wear and tear and, and bitterness and stuff. No. Were, never, were you happy? How'd you cope? Yeah, yeah I was very happy. Yeah, that, that did not involve whether I was happy or not happy. Uh, I, I, I coined a phrase for myself and myself only, and it became it was very cynical, which I'm not a cynic. Uh, normally, but it became very cynical. And that is, if Hollywood was for it, I was against it. And I was right all the time. So it didn't really affect me one way or the other. I knew where I was. I knew what was expected of me. And uh, I I wasn't going to change anybody's hearts and minds. I knew that. But you never played the Hollywood scene either. You weren't weren't the guy to hang out night after night in all the parties well, no, the guy that made it, but you made did, the appearances where you needed I did to make my them. share. And, you know, I went to the parties that I kind of wanted to go to. And I had a lot of friends there. I had a lot of people I really liked who 
obviously were very left of me, uh, but we just didn't talk about it. So it never came up. Um, it made life a lot easier and uh, I could swim. I could swim instead of sink, right. you know, and that's basically what it is. But I had to, I had to just be quiet, be silent and not say anything. And that's how I survived and I survived and I thrived. So, and then to answer your question, Ryan, I outed him. <laughs> True, he did. Is that, is that right? I can remember. He said, you know, I want you to go back. I was talking about something. And he said, I want you to go back and do a video on that. And I said, absolutely not. People really like me. Yeah. <laughs> I want to keep it that way if you don't mind. And he said, no, no, no. You need to do this and talk me into yeah. it. Yeah. It's about finally, time you got crossed, over that people liking you. I crossed that Rubicon of people liking me, that's for sure. All of a sudden, nobody liked me anymore. And, uh, well, actually, a lot of people like you. In fact, well, in but fact you know there's what a core group of people that like you even more now. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. And Ryan, a couple, a couple quick questions for you before we wrap up. Sure. Uh, the president's looking at pulling our troops out of Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, with all of your experience in the Middle East, is, is, is this going to be a good idea? Uh, I, I think it's absolutely terrible, uh, to be honest with you. Um, Afghanistan, I understand the frustration with. I just, the only other scenario I, I'm envisioning is the Taliban and the other groups taking over and then them using that land to destabilize Pakistan and get a hold of their nuclear weapons. So it's not so much about the impact on Afghanistan as it is on Pakistan to me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and all those groups in Pakistan have, have global ambitions and have said they're going to blow up the White House at some point. Um, but in Syria specifically, I mean, I'm upset because when I went to Iraq, I was so impressed with the Kurds who are pro-Israeli, pro-American. Um, they're really a, a shining light in the darkness of the Middle East. And I they're openly everybody saying, hates them. what? I said, and everybody hates them. And, and everybody hates them. And, and so they're, you know, they're faced with genocide now, thanks to Turkey. Erdogan somehow becomes best friends with every American president since 2002. I don't know how, but there's, there's something he does. And uh, so they're facing genocide, but most people don't know this. There's Christians in Syria that fight with the Kurds, like under their command, and they're warning that there are 100,000 Christians in that area that Turkey and their jihadists want to massacre once we're out of there. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, I, I'm, I wanted to get your opinion on that because I understand the president's goal of getting Americans out. I understand the president's goal of us not paying to be the policemen of the world, which we've been doing for 100 plus years. But I also worry about, you know, what happens in a vacuum because power vacuums create dictators and create evil deeds. And it's kind of what your, your thinking is, is going to take place here. Yeah, we're talking about genocide. We're talking about genocide and, and potentially extinguishing uh, one of the most important bright lights that we have in the Middle East, which is the Kurdish people who are appreciative of our support, but we've never supported them enough. And, and we've certainly backstabbed them a number of times. We've been doing so recently. Um, and, and it's very sad to see. As we're getting troops out of these areas, I mean, I, I would love the day when that happens. I think that should be like our official goal is, you know, permanently leave these places over the long term, but that's never going to happen until we have an infrastructure set up to wage ideological warfare like we had during the Cold War. It's amazing to me that since 9-11, we still haven't done that. Bring back the Cold Warriors. If we brought down the Soviet Union and debunked communism, then it actually should be easier and cheaper to do the same to radical Islam, considering what they're doing on a daily basis. That's a, uh, that's a very sensible response, I think. My last question for you, and that is the connection between the women's movement and Islam. They, <laughs> they have Islamic leaders in the women's movement, and it would, at least to us on the surface, and you, you have more information, but to us on the surface, it would appear that much of Islam and certainly Sharia law would not be conducive to women's freedom. So what's the connection here? It's ironic that you'll have really women that are connected to radical Islamic forces, whether it's Linda Sarsour or other people who defend Farrakhan, which is like, right. me, 
leading the women's march. But then you look at Iran and the women there are leading the protests against the regime, taking off their hijab and burning it with cameras rolling, knowing that they're going to be identified and thrown into jail for that. I mean, the contrast here is unbelievable where the women's movement is more friendly towards radical Islam in America. And then in the Muslim countries, the women's movement is at war with radical Islam. It's incredible. Uh, The group that I work for put out a documentary some years ago called Honor Diaries, all about the treatment of women in Muslim majority societies. And that did spark uh, some change. Some of the backlash that you see against these female uh, leaders, these activists who embrace Farrakhan, who, just as an aside, is teaming up with the Church of Scientology, just so you, so you know how weird things are getting. Um, but some of that backlash... Farrakhan is teaming up with the Scientologists? Oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, really? Big development, yeah. There's, it, so it's Nation of Islam is becoming almost like the Islamic wing of the Church of Scientology. And by the way, I'm, I'm broadcasting today from Clearwater Beach. Oh, wonderful. I can look out the window and see, see their headquarters. You, you definitely shouldn't have just said that. <laughs> 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 oh, they're becoming to look for me. Yeah. It right, seems to me to that it, on the show, it has been. I mean, it's been a really, really interesting, eye-opening uh, experience, and we really appreciate you coming on. And Chuck, we will have a link to Ryan's uh, film uh, right in the show notes at bluntforcetruth.com, as well as links to his social media and to his website. So folks, we encourage you to go watch the film. You can go right to our website and find the link to it. Uh, Ryan, anytime you want to come back, you've got uh, news you want to share with us, by all means, reach out to us and we'll be happy to have you back. Absolutely. Oh, that'd that'd be fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Blunt Force Truth, and we'll see you next time.